the Ortho PAC, hosted by Sam Dyer. Welcome to the Ortho PAC, where we discuss up-to-date orthopedic topics for the busy clinician. I invite you to sit back and relax as I attempt to fill in the gaps between education, current events, and real-world practice. Today's guest is Les Phillips, PhD. Dr. Phillips is a licensed psychologist in North Carolina. Welcome, Dr. Phillips. Thank you. Glad to be here. Glad to have you. So I wanted to also discuss some of your training and practice of mind-body techniques. We have several things that I was hoping we could spend some time on. Hypnosis, mindful meditation, calming techniques, and something called energy psychology. And I'm hoping you can give us a definition of that. If you don't mind taking some time to tell our listeners about each one of these techniques, who might benefit from a treatment, how you decide on treatments, do you try one and see what happens, or do you prescribe multiple techniques? Just curious how this goes. I sort of lump these together in, in I would just call them sort of roughly mind-body medicine or mind-body techniques in that you're, you're using attentional focus or so-called mental or psychological processes to try to influence something. In this case, it's typically pain. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be, but most people come for those kind of things. It's pain and or pain slash stress related to the particular medical alarm. So I'll, I'll start with mindfulness meditation because it gets a lot of airplay these days and rightly so. Mindfulness meditation practices probably date back at least a couple of thousand years or more. Some of this is rooted in ancient yoga practices, which is all about mindfulness. And we might just say mindfulness is being focused on the present moment with some degree of self-compassion. I could mindfully drink my cup of coffee in the morning. I could sip it and savor it and swallow it and feel the warmth bloom in my chest and say, wow, that's so delicious. Or I could be thinking about my day and drink that coffee down and hardly taste it. A lot of our mental processes are not focused on the present moment. They're focused on the, the future or on something that's already happened. And so life goes by kind of literally mindlessly. How could that mindful practice, and I can do that informally by simply slowing down and sipping and savoring my coffee or whatever it is I'm doing, or I could take a few minutes each day or at least every few days and do nothing but focus on one thing and try to keep that thing foremost in my mind and not if other distractions arise, but of course they do. But when they do, I simply bring myself, I say, I'm sorry, Sam, where were we? And I gently bring my focus back to whatever the object of my meditation is. Usually that's my breathing. Most meditative traditions have focus on the breath as a, as a key component. They, they have this saying, the mind is the kite and the breath is the string. Formal mindful practices, I'm taking this next five minutes or 10 or whatever, and I'm breathing in and breathing out, and I'm simply observing that breathing. I could bring other objects to my mindful awareness, like how I'm walking, or I could be uh, looking at particular uh, shapes or colors or hearing sounds or feeling other sensations or some combination of those. You wouldn't think that would have a lot to do with how people's pain is, but as it turns out, there's a fair amount of research going back to a fellow named John Cabot Zinn, who uh, is kind of credited with bringing mindfulness meditation to medicine in the United States. And he developed a program called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, which incorporates mindfulness meditation with a little bit of yoga into a very nice uh, eight-week training series that helps one develop this skill set. But he published several studies, and even recent ones have been published, that suggest that people do mindfulness practices are more able to regulate pain. And it's not necessarily that they're trying to relax. And it's interesting, this mindfulness is more like sharpening of my attention or awareness than it is trying to deeply relax. Now, sometimes you might get quite relaxed when you're practicing, and other times it, you may be constantly plagued by monkey chatter of your mind. But it seems like that returning and returning to the focus of your, of your meditation seems to have an overall therapeutic or down-regulating effect 
on the arousal mechanisms of the brain. And it causes you to learn to open around or relax into whatever's going on, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. And in that sense, you're not trying to make anything happen. You're just resting or, or allowing what is happening to happen and not resisting it. And so there's a certain elegance to that practice that I think is very helpful. There are some other sort of sub mindfulness practices that would go with that, but that's a general group. Coming back to then hypnosis, which always gets a lot of buzz and uh, people's notions about hypnosis often are rooted in what they've seen in the media or on television. And it usually has to do with something like a person having a pocket watch out and they're swinging it in front of this other person's eyes back and forth. And the person is slowly turning into a zombie while the hypnotist says you are getting sleepy. People have a lot of misconceptions about that. And they, they think that the hypnotized, if you would call that person is under the control of this other person. But that's not so, because if, if that were really true, then criminals would hypnotize people and force them to go rob banks. But you don't really hear that as a common criminal defense, and you don't hear people getting prosecuted for crimes that they didn't commit or didn't knew they committed while they were in hypnosis. Hypnosis is a sort of a, a, a combination of heightened focus, but also heightened ability to, to follow a suggestion in most people have some suggestion ability and some people have quite a bit of it. So not everybody is a good hypnotic subject, but probably about 70% or so of people are reasonably good hypnotic subject. And maybe about 10% are not very good hypnotic subjects. And about 10% might be really good hypnotic subject. And a very good hypnotic subject might be able to have a painful medical procedure without any anesthesia or with very minimal anesthesia, for example, a dental procedure. There's a hypnosis programs for women delivering babies that have become popular. But you're using a self-suggestion kind of thing or with a, a little help. And again, many people can follow suggestions and do follow suggestions. They just don't realize that they are. So we're doing something on purpose that happens spontaneously. I invite your listeners to think about any times they've been driving their car, not under the influence of any alcohol or other drug, but they simply arrived back at their house or apartment and they had no recollection of the drive. And that's not a bit uncommon. They call that generally highway hypnosis. And you sort of just go into a spontaneous little trance while you're driving. Same thing happens in school. And all of a sudden the bell rings and it's time to go. Or when you're engrossed in something that's really interesting, if your listener has the ability to get lost in a good book or good movie, chances are they're a good hypnotic subject. If you're a person who has a great deal of, of time, uh, a great deal of difficulty rather, uh, not being distracted by environmental things, that person probably wouldn't do quite as well with hypnosis. But it may be worth exploring anyway, because a person who is somewhat less hypnotizable could become more so. And then there are some formal ways of assessing hypnotizability, which have been looked at quite a bit in the research. There's a fellow named David Spiegel, who's a psychiatrist at Stanford University, and his father and mother were both psychiatrists, and his father was a fairly famous hypnotist and professor too. So they've been studying hypnotizability and hypnosis at Stanford for a long time. And there are several indices of hypnotizability. And if, if your listeners want to look up David Spiegel and hypnosis, they'll find a lot on him and some great talks on hypnosis that he does, as well as some little tests of hypnotizability that they may find worthy of exploring. Mm -hmm. With the hypnosis, so if you're using this as a treatment, do you offer suggestions of behavioral modification during hypnosis? Sometimes I do, Sam, but I tend not to do it as an exclusive thing. Like, for example, if, if a patient came in and says, hypnotize me and make me stop smoking, they have something in mind like, every time I see a cigarette, I'll become violently ill or something like that. Hypnotic suggestion tends not to work very well in the negative. Like you will not crave sweets. You will not have an urge to smoke a cigarette. Tends to respond better in the positive. Like 
I deserve to have healthy lungs and, and be fit and attractive or, you know, whatever it is that the person wants. And so I tend to use hypnotic suggestion along those lines, but also try to help the person develop an overall behavioral strategy that helps them be more successful at it. So that like, for example, hypnotize me and make me not want to drink alcohol, but I happen to have a case full of beer in the freezer or refrigerator rather. You know, I've got um, all kinds of sweet treats in the house, but I'm going to get a hypnotic suggestion that I'm, you know, I, I don't like sweets. So I'm not saying those kinds of things are impossible, but they're, they're not likely as likely to be successful as a combination of looking at the environmental triggers, as well as using hypnotic suggestion to develop what I want to happen instead of what I don't. Mm -hmm. That makes perfect sense. And I'm sorry to interrupt your train there. We, I think we had uh, calming techniques and energy psychology in our list. I'm just going to add in, you know, depending on how one goes about calming, there are many strategies of doing that. And a lot of people know these and they may have done them in the past, but probably not thought about doing them for their pain, or maybe they actually use them for the pain, but not in a consistent and proactive way. For example, many people, Sam, know that breathing in a certain way is calming. And so patients will say to me, yes, I, I say, do you use any kind of relaxation or mind body strategies? And the patient will say, yes, I do some deep breathing. And my usual question when they say that is, yes, can you show, can you show me how you do it? Because most people, if you ask them to take a deep breath, they don't take a deep breath. They take a shallow breath in which they elevate their chest and shoulders and only capture about a third of their lung volume. But it, and the, really what they're doing is they're over breathing, but they're not getting more oxygen. If I ask that same person to take one of their, their fingers and pinch one of their nostrils shut and with their mouth closed to just sip the breath in through their open nostril as if it was hot coffee and if you went too fast, it would burn you. That person is very likely to get a pretty deep breath as defined by filling the lower lobes of the lungs. So if that same person took their other hand and put it on their navel, they should feel their belly fill out or open as they're breathing in, like blowing up a balloon or a, a, or a, a beach ball. Conversely, when they empty the, the air, that the belly should come back. So learning to breathe with the diaphragm and with the mouth closed, and then once you have established that pattern, if they've lost it, about 50% of the people walking around are probably mostly mouth breathing. These are also people who snore a lot, by the way, and tend to have a lot of more respiratory difficulties as a group. That being said, breathing in a certain way, whether there's a certain cadence, like into the count to four, out to the count to four, or a slower out breath, like I'm breathing into four and breathing out eight, or if I, if I feel depressed or lack of energy in which I take big, deep in breaths, and small out breaths like uh, the Wim Hof method. There's a lot that can be done with breathing. And even if a person swears, oh, I can't meditate, it's just too boring, or I can't attend uh, with my concentration. There's multiple breath practices that are easy and very, very effective at learning to calm the nervous system, uh, calm the pain, relax the muscles, slow the heart rate, lower the blood pressure maybe help you fall asleep or fall back asleep. There's literally almost something for any kind of malady that's available in, in breath work. And there's a lot of great resources available now that illustrate that very well. So I'm gonna put that breathing in general relaxation and then going through and gently tensing to relax the muscles in a sequence, the so-called Jacobson method. And many people have done this one before. Again, a great way of relaxing and letting go of tension. Great stuff. Dr. Phillips, thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Coming up next week, more with Les Phillips. Thank you for joining the Ortho PAC podcast. Extremities in the Carolinas, Trauma for General Orthopedics, the Charlotte Conference, May 21st and 22nd, 2021. Check out the PAOS.org website for details.